Spell the last name. First defendant is G-O-C-T-I. First name is John. Second defendant is G-U-E-R-R-I-E-R-I. First name Edward. Edward number 358 of 1989. Charge. Arraign him, please. Wait for the other defendant. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Bruce Gubler, C-U-T-L-E-R from Mr. Diamond. John L. Pollock and Charles Weintraub, Hoffman Pollock, and Anthony Moreri. The people assistant is Michael Chercast. Your Honor, at this time, the people would like to serve indictment 358 of 89, covering the indictments for the United States. Arraign the defendants, please. John Gaddy and Anthony Moreri. The grand jury of the county of New York is filed in item number 358 of 1989, charging each of you with the crimes of conspiracy in the fourth degree and assault in the first degree on two counts. John Gaddy, how do you plead these charges? Guilty or not guilty? Anthony Moreri, how do you plead these charges? Guilty or not guilty? Based on two counts. Your Honor, the people would serve. Intercept notice within the next 15 days. We will be providing copies of the intercept orders and reports. We will observe state notice within that 15 days. We will serve a copy of the statements. All right, thank you. Do you have an application? Yes, Your Honor. First, I'd like to uh, give to the court that they have copies of the uh, record of, of uh, arrests. John, the uh, people are going to ask. The defendant John Gotti be remanded, as the court is aware, under uh, CPL section uh, 1510.30, there are uh, nine, eight criteria to look at. I think uh, six of them are relevant uh, to this bail application. We feel that the uh, going to the okay. okay. Adam, the defendant Gotti's principles, character, reputation, and habits um, are certainly one of fact that he is alleged to be, and we have uh, evidence of in the form of wiretap information, the head of an organized criminal organization called the Gambino Crime Family. Um, he is 
someone who has consistently put his and the interests of his associates and family above that of society. We think that uh, that factor strongly mitigates to uh, holding this defendant in. Um, his employment and financial resources, uh, his employment is allegedly as a salesman for a particular plumbing concern. Um, this gentleman has been subject of uh, extensive uh, surveillance, and during that surveillance, we have yet to see him um, at his employment in any way, shape, or form. Um, that is his quote unquote legitimate employment. Um, his financial resources are literally that of the family, which is an extensive criminal organization uh, throughout the United States and throughout the world. I don't mean to overstate it, but uh, it's very difficult to get a handle on what his financial resources are and the formula part of that to ensure his return. Um, so that uh, we, we would just have to say at this point that the financial resources are enormous. We could also comment that uh, during the period of intercepts, uh, Mr. Gotti has um, gambled uh, numerous occasions and has lost enormous sums of money, uh, accounting in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. So that we know that he has idle money uh, available for him. Um, third is the family ties, the length of time in the residence. Uh, Mr. Gotti has been a resident of this, this community for his whole life, to our knowledge. Um, he has a family, um, and wife, and children. Um, but at the same time, the people would like to point out to the court that in 1973, uh, this defendant was. Uh, May of 1973, um, participated in a homicide. Um, that homicide led to an indictment um, with Mr. Gotti and Mr. Angelo Ruggiero. Mr. Ruggiero was apprehended. Um, there were substantial efforts made to apprehend Mr. Gotti, but Mr. Gotti chose to absent himself from his home. So that for a period of approximately a year, um, he was not at home. And uh, we think that, that goes to show that whatever ties they are, he still uh, has the election to put his interests ahead of his interests on the ties. Uh, the criminal record, Your Honor, uh, this defendant has been uh, uh, convicted on at least two occasions, one on uh, 1967 of theft of interstate shipment, uh, secondly, uh, in 1974, um, for, for this homicide, which is a manslaughter conviction. Um, we think that uh, this is a particularly cogent point because while there is charged presently before Your Honor a Class C felony which carries a possible penalty of 5 to 15, Your Honor, this individual is a potential persistent felony offender. As a persistent felony offender, and we think the criteria that is set out in subsection 70.10 for a sentence of a prison for a persistent felony offender uh, is pertinent here, and I think this, this defendant, if anyone meets it, we subject him to a sentence uh, for this case if convicted of potentially uh, 25 to life. Uh, a 25 to life sentence uh, is something that we think uh, anyone's been blanched at, and when someone was, had the predilection to return, when they know they were facing a 25 to life sentence, uh, that was in fact increased propensity to run. Uh, Your Honor. You're referring to the 66 conviction for attempted burglary? No, I'm not. Uh, unfortunately, Your Honor, that does not show all the federal convictions. <laughs> there is a federal conviction for uh, technical languages, theft of interstate shipment on December 1st of 1967, in which he did uh, four years in Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary. Would that constitute a felony crime in this state? Your Honor, we believe it does. For the predicate felony law? Yes, Your Honor, we believe it does. It's for the persistent predicate felony law. Um, and under the persistent predicate felony, you don't have to go look at this particular uh, facts and circumstances underlined, but you look at the fact that he was convicted and sentenced. Um, we believe he is eligible as a persistent felony, which is something of, of we think the court should take into account. Are you stating you apply a different test on, a, on making a determination whether someone is a persistent felon as, as opposed to well, a predicate Your Honor, felon? Your Honor, the quick people's position that under either test, this, this, uh, this uh, prior conviction, uh, in fact, uh, corresponds in the law. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything uh, else? Yes. Uh, Your Honor, the uh, people think that uh, Looking at um, the 
the, the final category, which is the strength of the people's case, that this case is a substantially a case based on wiretap information, I'd say 80 or 85 percent of that. Uh, we think that uh, all the witnesses that will be testifying are corroborated. Uh, we have taken an extensive period of time um, in putting this case together. This is crime occurred in May of 1986. Uh, we have taken that time because we want to be sure about it. We think, we think that this is a strong case based on wiretap information that the court certainly will have access to at the court's pleasure. Uh, and as such, that makes it a strong case, one in which uh, the defendant has to understand that if he's convicted and could face the substantial penalties that I've indicated, um, we think that there's a substantial likelihood that he's going to be from the jurisdiction. Mr. Cutler? Yes, sir. You wish to be here? Yes, may please the court. You're on my way back. <clears throat> I've represented uh, John Dyke since 1985. Uh, I don't know if the court is aware, but uh, in 1987, he was acquitted uh, in Brooklyn Federal Court of this so-called Gambino Association. Uh, in addition to which, Your Honor, John Gotti has basically followed night and day, every day by the police. Uh, and they've never seen him commit a crime, and they've never seen him do anything wrong. I was a little surprised last night, Judge, uh, uh, when they picked him up uh, at around 5 o'clock on Broadway with about 50 or, or 70 uh, agents and policemen, because had they called me up, Your Honor, rather than go to Judge Williams last night, uh, I could have seen you this morning with John. I tried three cases with him. I tried one in front of Judge Duffesey. I tried two in front of Judge Nickerson. He gets to court before the building opens. And the only issue here is whether he's going to show up. He has always shown up in every case he's ever had. He's always on time. As a matter of fact, Your Honor, most poignantly, in the federal court in Brooklyn, the United States attorneys both said that John Gotti is not a flight risk. Policemen have testified that John Gotti is not a flight risk. He has never, ever missed a court date. Judge, he hasn't been convicted of a crime for over 15 years. He was convicted, he pled guilty in 75, and went to jail, he came out. Since 77, they've been watching him every day, night, and day. As I said to you, we went to trial in Queens once, and then we went to trial in Brooklyn. As far as his family, Your Honor, you know he's been married well over 25 years. He has four children, four grandchildren. He's not going anyplace. He's been in New York his whole life. He's never ran away from a problem ever. We are both confident, Your Honor, even though we got the indictment today, we got an indicia of it last night, we'll win this case. I'm not concerned about the case. I'm concerned about the DA making a bail application for a remand. And I'm concerned about the fact that they chose to lock him up at night rather than call me up. Because you know, Judge, if you want to know where John Gotti is, Mr. Cutler, I was concerned also when they asked for the warrant. I'm sorry? I was concerned also. Yes, sir. Because if you want to know where he is, I know where he is, and the police know where he is. Because they follow him day and night. So there's no problem with flight. I was asking you, not in any way disingenuous, Judge, to release him. Because had they not arrested him last night, we would have been here together at 9 o'clock in the morning. I think the case is weak. There's not the slightest indicia uh, of evidence that John will ever flee. You're, you're expressing your opinion that it's weak. Yes, sir. Uh, the district attorney says, in his opinion, it's strong. Thank you. Uh, well, I want you to know, and also, Your Honor, one other thing. Uh, last night, uh, after we went through the speech, Judge Williams felt constrained to keep him overnight. But I felt, in my heart, she wanted to let him go. She, had well, she wanted to look. She had the power. She had the power. Sir. I'll hear you. Your Honor, excuse me. If I could I'll let you respond after respond. both applications. Okay. I don't know that there's been an application yet. Have are you making an application? I certainly am. Would you like to make it first, sir? Yes. yes. Your Honor, the people are asking for a remand as to Mr. Guglieri. Uh, for, as appears from his sheet and our records, uh, is not eligible for any additional punishment as, as Mr. Gotti would be. Uh, Considered persistent, but he is eligible for uh, from five to fifteen years on this this uh, more ties uh, that Mr. Gotti has admitted. Uh, we think that uh, Mr. Guerrieri uh, has used 
um, a number of different names where he's living, where he currently resides. He's using a, a, a second name, uh, that of Anthony Albano. The apartment's registered Mr. Albano. Um, the, the, the contact that we have for his Con Ed bills, a telephone or a video store, um, we think that uh, uh, he is a poor, how much bail will ensure his return. Uh, and, and because of that, we think that remand is the Your Honor, uh, Mr. Guerreri, I've represented for a number of years. Guerreri is not as strong, but because the Gotti case is so strong, it's only a slight difference. It is a strong case, yes. I hear you. Your Honor, uh, I've represented Mr. Guerreri for a number of years. It's minor gambling cases. That's the totality of his record. Perhaps one contempt some years ago. He, in fact, does have very strong roots in Queens County. He owns the house at 130, 137-23 Lafayette Street between where his wife lives. He has two daughters, and he's been married for 31 years. He spends a good deal of time at his cousin's house. Uh, perhaps that's why the district attorney kept the daughter, one of the, his two grown daughters, one of whom was in a serious automobile accident a number of months ago and was in a coma and is now undergoing physical rehabilitation on a daily basis. Mr. Guerreri has been, and I'm sure if he's been under surveillance, the police can uh, verify this, in taking his daughter on a daily basis, she's in a semi-coma, to physical rehabilitation out in Nassau County through all this period of time. It's a C felony, but for the notoriety of this case, which I assume and I know is not an element in fixing bail, bail would be fixed at a minimum, as a minimum in this case. We would be talking bail in terms of maybe $2,500 or $5,000. The indictment that was furnished me minutes ago shows that his participation in the indictment is minimal. Well, Mr. Gotti, I'm, the court is setting bail in the amount of $100,000 bond of cash. With respect to uh, Mr. Guerreri, bail is set in the amount of $50,000 bond of cash. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. uh, hold it. This case is assigned to Judge Atlas, Part 39. The matter is being sent to Judge Atlas because he has uh, a related matter. Yes, sir. We need a date from you, Your Honor. Yes. A Monday, please. Yeah. Put it on for next Monday, the 30th. Your Honor, we just further Yes, hold it a minute, please. Take seats. The matter is on for uh, January 30th, Part 39, Judge Atlas's Part, 111 Center Street. Yes, what is your application? People ask that there be a condition of bail if the defendants do not travel outside the United States. If there are going to be any... Do you have a passport, Mr. Gotti? No, Your Honor. Do you have a passport, sir? They leave... We've got a passport. I don't know where they could go. So the people will also ask that we be notified if uh, the defendant intended to travel outside the state. I'll restrict them to the continental limits of the United States. If they are going to be leaving uh, the state of New York, however, I would advise, uh, I'm, I'm ordering that they advise, you advise your attorney, and your attorney is to advise the district attorney. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sure. Send him this in the hospital, Judge. So you need a hospital room? Right. Well, what do you want to do that, out? or you want Atlas no. to do that? When is he getting out? Where's Atlas to? He, he, he may not. He may not. He's dying? Yeah, he's one. Oh, okay. As long as we got two copies. There's a note which says, we would like to hear the Rikers Island tape and the May 7th tape. Also, we would like the federal transcript from the Rikers Island tape and the tape between James McElroy and Detective Strip. We will play the tapes in the order that they appear. The Rikers Island tape will be played first. Uh, now
Now, I don't know about transcripts. Uh, are there transcripts in the book? Okay, there are transcripts in the book. You know the rules. If you want to, you, you may. Uh, let me know when it's ready, Mr. Schlanger. May 16, 1986. The time is now 7.20 a.m. My name is Captain Ralph Mezjewski from the Office of the Inspector General, New York City Department of Correction. I am placing this recording device in the visit room of Anna M. Cross Center on Rikers Island in anticipation of an upcoming conversation between inmate Francis Featherstone and a person by the name of Kelly and, and whoever else may engage in this conversation. Permission to record this conversation was previously granted by M.A. Featherstone. This recording device is now being deactivated pending its installation in the visit area. I'm 
Please let me know. <coughs> All right, it's ready. Thank <laughs> you. 
May 7th tape. ready to do it. Oh, 
Spencer's. We see on January 18th of 1986, a man consolidating his power, a man consolidating his role. He says, you want service, I want respect. And if he gets what he wants, he's going to have a legacy, a hell of a legacy, a 30-year legacy. This is a man who's planning for the future. He's planning to put together his power and control it and go forward into the future. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, to sum up, 
On this first point, John Gotti is, in fact, the boss of the Gambino crime fam family in 1986. He's the boss. He's the boss who's consolidating the power. He's the boss who's concerned about the structure. He's the boss who wants to insulate himself from other people. Look at that, the man who's talking about these things and his desires and what he wants and how he wants respect. And you start to understand that when he's challenged, how he's got to, got to react. And now let's go on to that section section. Let's look at the Gambinos and John Gotti's interest in bankers and brokers. <clears throat> How do we prove it? The simple fact is bankers and brokers, the establishment bankers and brokers was a downtown restaurant. You've heard testimonies of a downtown restaurant for many years. The site that was bankers and brokers was a very, very valuable piece of land. Mr. Caffaro describes to you how there was the discussion between Fat Tony Salerni, Salerno, Nicoletta, and Paul Castellano about the sale of that very valuable piece of land. And the sale was contingent on who was going to get money was whether a high rise is built. And I would submit to you is that there, at that time there was a 2% club that controlled the concrete industry, but that piece of land in 84, 85 was very, very valuable. When Mr. Castellano died, the interest passed to Mr. Gotti, and Mr. Cafaro's talked to you about that interest. In the MCC, he's talking to Cafaro and others about that interest. He wants his piece of bankers and brokers. But let's just look at directly at the restaurant. The restaurant bankers and brokers moves from one spot to another. It has to be reconstructed. And who owns it? Who controls it? Philip Modica. Who are the people who are selling this? The Castellano kids. This is a Gambino establishment. It is Gambino run and controlled. It is absolutely clear from the SLA records, from the testimony of Mr. Kafara, from the testimony of Mr. K McCabe, that this restaurant is Gambino controlled and run and when you listen to the tapes and again we haven't played all of them but when you listen to the tapes you can tell of Gotti's interest of Gotti's interest in Philly of the excitement generated by when something happens at this restaurant <clears throat> it's a recurrent theme for us here ladies and gentlemen something I'm gonna point again to you that Kafaro says it and the experts say it, and the tapes say it. Can you have any doubt that there's an interest, a Gambino interest, John Gotti's interest for John Gotti's friend, Philly Modica, in bankers and brokers? I would submit to you, you can't. All right. Judge? Apparently, this is the time we're going to take, <coughs> excuse me, our afternoon break. You must continue to keep an open mind, not form conclusions, and don't discuss the case. We'll have you back here uh, roughly in 10 minutes, perhaps a little longer if you need more time inside. Please uh, keep an open mind. All rise, please. All rise. John Gotti, people have proved that John Gotti is the boss of a disciplined, organized, structured family. And the fact that that family and John Gotti has an interest in bankers and brokers restaurant. Next, next let's look at the fact that John O'Connor was responsible for the trashing of bankers and brokers. First, let's start with the testimony of Robert Bradley. He saw it. He saw O'Connor do it. He is a believable witness. There is no controversion to what he says. Angela Petrakis testified. 
You blame the Carpenters Local 608 for what happened. And most importantly for this case, John Gotti believed that Mr. O'Connor was responsible for that trashing. The tapes on February 7th and February 12th show that. Mm -hmm. So does the Rikers Island tape. Once again, third time in a row, we have witnesses corroborated by tapes. There can be no question that John Gotti and the Gambinos believed and blamed John O'Connor for the trashing of their restaurant. There was a question raised, why would O'Connor do this? Why would O'Connor, if he's connected to organized crime, do this? I would submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, you've heard testimony about the carpentry industry and the fact that Vinny DiNapoli and Louis DiNapoli were the movers and shakers, for the most part, in this industry. And they are Genovese. So that what O'Connor knew and what O'Connor did we could speculate about it. We could speculate if he knew that Gotti was behind it. We could speculate he didn't. Not going to speculate, ladies and gentlemen. What we do know is that Gotti blames O'Connor for that trashing. Now let's just stop right here. Let's stop and say that's all the evidence you heard in the case. That's all the evidence. What do you conclude? Well, you know. Gotti's the boss, he's new in power, he's trying to consolidate his power, he wants, as he said, respect. You know that he's got this establishment which is trashed by this guy John O'Connor, and let's add one fact that no one is controverted here, and that is that John O'Connor is shot on May 7th, 1986. If you're a detective, what do you conclude? What do you think? Jeez, Gotti's the boss. This kind of family, his, his restaurant's broken up by this guy, and then the guy is shot three months later. Well, it looks like he's a chief suspect. All right? It's someone you look at. It's certainly not proof beyond a reasonable doubt. But it's someone you really look at. Because there's motive here, ladies and gentlemen. There's motive. All right. Let's go on. Let's go on. Let's see if we can fill in and, and pin this on this chief suspect. Let's look at who the Westies are, the relationship with the Gambinos and John Gotti. You've heard testimony from two witnesses, James McElroy and Vincent Confara. One expert witness, Kenny McCabe. You've also heard tapes from Gotti's Club, tape from Rikers Island, and a tape from Detective Ronnie Strip. Again, what I was talking about earlier. Look at those three different investigations, how they come together in this one case. No one could have set this up. No one could have predicted this, ladies and gentlemen. Let's analyze what they say. What does McElroy say about this relationship? And I'm going to deal a little bit later about McElroy's believability or not. But what does McElroy say about this? He says there's a closeness between Coonan and Gotti. He says that Coonan would talk about Gotti, that Coonan would go out to Gotti's club. He says that Coonan has a construction company, Marine Construction. And Gotti would help him out with marine construction in the construction industry, in projects. He says there's been a long-term relationship between the Westies and the Gambinos that John Gotti has picked up on and expanded because his close personal relationship with Jimmy Coonan. He tells you about Tommaso's in 1978 the sit-down at Tommaso's, where Jimmy Coonan was going to rush in 
if the phone doesn't ring and shoot them up. He tells you that that meeting is to sort out that relationship. And it's sorted out. The relationship's sorted out. They put loan sharking money out in the street for the Gambinos. They do other acts of violence for the Gambinos. They participate in sit-downs. Jimmy McElroy tells you about the Van Ness sit-down. That he ha has a sit-down where he's represented by Roy DeMeo. And Danny Marino says, don't cut this guy's throat. Not because he cares about the guy's throat, because he wants to make sure that the guy can continue to pay off his brother's debt. Talks about putting it on record. He doesn't know what these records are from Adam. He tells you about that. He tells you that after the Leone homicide, that Vincent Leone, this ILA official, was with Danny Marino, steals from the Gambinos. Goes to Jimmy Coonan, steals from the Westies. The Westies don't take that. They kill him. Kill him. And then he's got to go tell Danny Marino what they've done. He tells you all these things. And then Kenny McCabe comes on. Kenny McCabe tells you that there's a relationship between the Gambinos and DeMeo. He tells you there's a relationship between the Gambinos and the Westies. And that DeMeo's the one who has this kind of close relationship back in the 80s. He tells you that there's surveillance seeing Westies and Gambinos together. He tells you about Tommaso's. He explains it in much more detail than Jimmy McElroy. Because McElroy wasn't there. But McCabe has talked to a whole series of people. The defense says, geez, this is hearsay. Uh, what's the source of this information? Why didn't they question Mr. McCabe? Why didn't they ask him the source of all these things? I would submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, it didn't seem so important to them at the time. But when they saw it corroborated, Jimmy McElroy and his description between the Westies and the Gambinos, now on summation we're going to say, why this is hearsay. Cafaro. Vincent Cafaro. What does he tell you? He tells you that in 1984, 83, there's a meeting between Genovese and Gambino. That at this meeting, they talk about the hidden mob, the Westies, that Paul Castellano has, and how that's not in the rules, according to, to, to uh, Cafara. The Tony Solano says, you can't do that. No hidden mobs. These guys are going crazy. No hidden mobs. That's consistent with what McElroy tells you, and it's consistent with what McCabe tells you, that the Gambinos have the Westies, that they are an associated group. Ladies and gentlemen, if I stop there on this issue, I would submit to you we proved it. We proved the relationship between the Gambinos and the Westies. But we don't. We don't stop there. We've got what we have throughout this case, and that is corroboration from the tapes. And these tapes very clearly establish that the Westies are an arm of the Gambinos in general and, in specific, John Gotti. He talks to them. He brings them into the club. He talks to them about business and about old times. Things that you've heard about in this case. Ultimately, I will then tell you what the elements are of the various charges, the charges which will be contained on the verdict sheet which will accompany you folks into the jury room. The law permits the police to perform surveillance, including the taking of photographs, recording license plates, and following persons and efforts to overhear conversations on the street or in a building by placing themselves in close proximity to the subject of the surveillance. The wiretapping in this case was in accordance with the law. The use of the bugs in the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club and the telephone taps there were authorized. The police were authorized to listen to all of the conversations about which you heard any testimony or reference, including those between husbands and wives. 
the taping of the Rikers Island conversation of Michael or Mickey Rather Featherstone, Kevin Kelly, and Larry Palermo was also legal. A person named Michael Goodell's name was mentioned in one or more of the opening statements as a potential witness. He did not testify. The fact that he did not testify is not a matter about which you should speculate, even if you happen to recall that his name was mentioned. Disregard the matter entirely. You have learned, <clears throat> excuse me, in the course of this trial that a small part of the number of hours of recordings made in this investigation, this case, this matter, uh, were submitted to you. As I've indicated earlier during your deliberations, you were not permitted to engage in any speculation. In accordance with that instruction, you are not to speculate as to what might or might not be heard in the other portions of the recordings. Trials are conducted in accordance with long-tested rules of evidence, a prime factor of which is relevance to the issues on trial. As the indictment and evidence make clear, there are several individuals alleged to have been involved at varying stages in the shooting of John O'Connor who are not on trial in this case. You may not draw any conclusion with respect to a defendant's guilt or non-guilt from the fact that other individuals are not on trial here. Additionally, you may not speculate regarding anyone whose name you heard. You are to consider whether the charges against these two individuals have been proven. During your deliberations, you should decide only what is needed to resolve the issues related to the proof of the elements and to the issues of credibility and accuracy. Don't dwell on matters that are not necessary to those decisions. No jury can be expected to resolve each issue that arises in a trial. You must, however, resolve those necessary for your decisions as outlined above. Each factual decision that you make does not have to have been established beyond a reasonable doubt. The elements, however, must be established beyond a reasonable doubt. You may use, in reaching your verdict, only facts which you are satisfied to have been shown to exist. It is on the ultimate issue, proof of the various elements of the individual charges, which I'll define later, to which the burden beyond a reasonable doubt applies. In this case, has involved the use, in part, of tape-recorded conversations. The tapes were admitted into evidence, and the tapes constitute part of the testimony and evidence in this case. You are free to consider them, together with all of the other evidence in the case, which you find credible and acceptable, in reaching your findings of fact. Excuse me. However, you may only consider the tape recordings as evidence of guilt or non-guilt of the defendants, provided that you are first satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that it is the defendant whose voice and words appear on the tape. The transcripts, other than double A, are not in evidence in this case. The transcripts were given to you as an aid only. Many people can follow the tapes better by listening to them in conjunction with or while looking at a transcript. The transcripts, though, are not evidence, and this means that you will not be able to use them in the jury room other than that exhibit double A, although you will, if you wish, be allowed to hear the tapes in this courtroom as often as you wish. In court, you may use the transcripts as you wish, all, some, or none of the time. As to any portions of the tapes themselves which you find unintelligible after however much time you have listened to them, you are not to speculate about what may have been said there. You'll simply disregard the portion that you find unintelligible. Similarly, if the transcript contains words that you don't hear on the tape, it's your duty to disregard that portion of the transcript since it is only the tape that is in evidence. As I've said several times, and as I emphasize now, what is in fact on the recordings, if anything, is for you to decide. No one else's opinion counts in the final analysis. The issue is not how long it took to prepare a transcript about which you've heard, but rather what, if anything, is on the tape. You are free to listen to the tapes as often as you need to to decide what, if anything, is there. During the testimony of some witnesses, there was evidence presented that such witnesses had made a prior statement allegedly inconsistent with the trial testimony. Such prior statement may not be considered by you for the truth of its contents, 
The prior statements, if found by you to be inconsistent with the witness's trial testimony, though, may be considered by you as a factor in determining the credibility or accuracy of the person's trial testimony. If you find that a witness on an earlier occasion made a statement on the same topic, which is in fact inconsistent with a statement he made at trial, and not merely a different phrasing of it, you may consider the difference on the issue of the witness's accuracy and credibility. The earlier statement, however, may not be used as evidence in this case. Its use, if any, is limited to pointing out that a variance in testimony exists. You have the discretion to determine the significance of any of the variance and whether it is of such a nature as to affect your assessment of the witness's truthfulness or accuracy. Some variances, your common sense will tell you, are important, while some are inconsequential. There has been testimony in this trial that witnesses James McElroy and Vincent Caffaro have previously been convicted of crimes. While a person who has been convicted of a crime is nevertheless a competent witness, such conviction may be shown for the purpose of affecting the credibility of that person. You may therefore take such conviction into consideration as a factor in determining the credibility of witnesses with prior criminal convictions. During the testimony of James McElroy, he admitted that he intentionally testified falsely on a prior occasion, that is, the trial of James Coonan. In deciding whether James McElroy's testimony at this trial is credible, you should consider his testimony that on such other occasion he intentionally gave false testimony. Because of that previous admitted false testimony, you are at liberty to disregard all of James McElroy's testimony at this trial on the principle that one who testifies falsely on one occasion may also testify falsely on another. However, you are not required to reject his testimony. You may consider all of the circumstances regarding his testimony at this trial as well as the reasons and circumstances of his false testimony and accept all or so much of his present testimony as you believe credible and worthy of belief, or you may reject it all. In determining the credibility of any witness and the weight to be given to that person's testimony, you may also consider the interest, if any, that a person has in the outcome of the trial or in testifying. A witness is an interested witness when, by reason of relationship, friendship, antagonism, or prejudice in favor of or against one party or the other, his testimony in your judgment is in fact biased or likely to be biased towards, this, towards one side or the party he favors. If you find that any witness is an interested witness, you should consider that interest in deciding the amount of credibility you will give to his testimony. A disinterested witness, on the other hand, is one who has no interest in the outcome of the trial or in testifying. In summary, you should not reject the testimony of any witness, interested or otherwise, merely because of the interest, nor should you accept the testimony of a disinterested witness merely because of such disinterest. You've heard evidence of an agreement between the people and James McElroy. Mr. McElroy agreed to testify for the people in exchange for lenient treatment for his fiance in that, in that, drug, in that pending drug prosecution. The people further agreed to inform the federal judge who sentenced him of the extent and nature of McElroy's cooperation and to provide that judge with the trial testimony. The people also agreed to inform Vincent Caffaro's sentencing judge of the extent and nature of Caffaro's cooperation and testimony at this trial. You should consider these agreements and any interest that McElroy and Caffaro may have in testifying as it affects their credibility. The law is common sense at work. The law reflects human nature. Consequently, the law requires that an accomplice's testimony be supported or corroborated. Some of the reasons for that are the reasons that I just outlined in describing the caution you should deal with McElroy's testimony. The law defines an accomplice as a witness in a criminal action who, according to the evidence admitted at trial, may reasonably be considered to have participated in the offense or crime charged. Because Mr. McElroy is an accomplice, you are required to be familiar with this principle of law that says no defendant may be convicted of any offense based upon the testimony of an accomplice unsupported by corroborative evidence tending to connect the defendant with the commission of such crime. Under that law, 
a defendant on trial may not be convicted solely on the basis of testimony of an accomplice. The law views with suspicion, for the reasons that I just gave above, the testimony of an accomplice in a criminal trial, since by his own testimony he was a participant in the events charged. So the law requires that some independent evidence support the accomplice's testimony. If such evidence exists, as I'll explain it to you, then you may use and rely on McElroy's testimony. The law requires that the testimony of an accomplice be corroborated by other evidence apart from the accomplice's own testimony. To be sufficient, that is to be corroboration, the other evidence, standing by itself, must satisfy the jury that it tends to connect the defendant with the commission of the crime in such a way as may reasonably satisfy you that the accomplice is telling the truth. The other evidence need not prove that a defendant is guilty of the crime charged. All that the law requires is that the other evidence satisfy you that a defendant was in some manner involved in the criminal transaction and that the accomplice, in testifying about that defendant's involvement, was telling the truth. If you find such other evidence insufficient to satisfy you that the defendant is connected or a defendant is connected with the commission of a crime in some manner, then you must disregard McElroy's testimony, strike it from your minds, and rely on the rest of the record in deciding the issues before you. On the other hand, if you find that such other evidence <coughs> exists and it is sufficient, then you may consider McElroy's testimony, together with all the other evidence in the case, in making your final determination as to the guilt or non-guilt of the defendants. Evidence has been presented by the people in this case as to a certain tape-recorded conversation in which statements were made allegedly by Kevin Kelly in a conversation with Larry Palermo and Mickey Featherstone at the Rikers Island prison. For reasons that need not and must not concern you, Kelly is unavailable to testify at this trial. Because he did not testify at trial and has not been available for cross-examination, you must examine the evidence concerning his alleged statements with care. In considering the tape recording of Kevin Kelly, you must first decide whether or not the alleged statements were in fact made by Kelly. If you find such statement was not made by Kelly, stop there and forget about the statement. On the other hand, if you, if you find that the statement was made by Kelly, then you should determine the reliability and trustworthiness of the statements themselves. You should consider all of the circumstances around, surrounding the making of the statement. In making your decision as to the reliability and trustworthiness of Kelly's alleged statements, you should consider these, th these three things. You must first be satisfied that there is independent evidence other than the statement itself which satisfy you that the statements are trustworthy and reliable. In other words, there must be some independent evidence other than the statement himself, themselves which corroborates and supports the facts asserted in the declarations. Consider whether, what other evidence, if any, supports and confirms the things that Kelly said. Consider all the circumstances under which the statement was made. Among the things you should consider is whether there was any motivation to say the words on the tape. Consider whether Kelly spoke naturally. Was the statement apparently a recitation of an event he lived through himself or participated in? Or was it just something he memorized? Was his statement unnatural, as if contrived, made up, or scripted? Or was he lying or exaggerating for some reason? The trustworthiness of his statement, we're talking about the Rikers Island tape, may be, may be affected by the motivation. The second thing you should consider, in addition to the reliability of it, is whether Kelly himself had competent knowledge about the facts that he spoke of. The third thing is that you must be satisfied that when the statement was made by Kelly, he was aware that his statement was against his penal interest and showed that he himself had participated in or engaged in conduct constituting a crime. In other words, you must be satisfied at the time Kelly made the statement, he was fully aware that by making the statement, he was subjecting himself to possible criminal prosecution if the statement was revealed or shown to or learned about by a police or prosecution office. If you're satisfied that the alleged declarations supposedly made by Kelly were in fact made by him, and, that they're, and if you're satisfied that the statements are reliable and trustworthy and based on competent knowledge, you may then give his taped statement such weight as you think appropriate in making your final decision as to the guilt or non-guilt of the defendants in this case. 
If you're not so satisfied, then disregard it. Proceed on the other matters, other evidence, other testimony and exhibits in this case. The Rikers Island tape was initiated, as you know, by Mickey Featherstone. Since he was a cooperating witness who was not here to be cross-examined, you cannot use as facts the statements attributed to Featherstone on the tape unless Kevin Kelly, who was not under arrest and not cooperating, adopted a statement made by Featherstone as his own or agreed with it. You may, of course, consider the facts or thoughts contained in Featherstone's statements when necessary to give meaning to Kevin Kelly's comments or to put them in context. In other words, if there was a conversation that you find that to have happened between Featherstone and Kelly, you can't rely as a factual matter on the, on the information contained in Featherstone's portion of the, of the conversation. The facts that you should focus on are what Kelly said. Featherstone was cooperating. Kelly uh, was not under arrest. In order to make Kelly's uh, statements make sense, though, if Kelly, for example, is responding to something that Featherstone said, and the only way you can put Kelly's statement into context or the only way you can give Kelly's uh, statement any meaning is if you make reference to what Featherstone had to say, then in that limited context, you're allowed to rely on what Featherstone had to say. The difference in treatment of Featherstone and Kelly, neither of whom were here to be cross-examined, is due to the fact of Kelly's supposed involvement in the shooting incident. If you are satisfied that the three factors have been met that I described earlier, then the reliability of the statement is enhanced and deemed to be a suitable substitute for cross-examination. Since Featherstone was cooperating and knew he was on tape, there is not present there the same reliability enhancing factors, assuming that you're satisfied that those three factors exist. And that's the reason why you, if you have decided that those three factors are present, you can rely, if you want to, on what Kelly says, because uh, he supposedly was involved in that shooting incident. Since Featherstone was cooperating, uh, you can't rely just on what he says. He wasn't available to be cross-examined, and the difference is uh, the reason that I just gave you. With regard to the Casa Nostra or the Mafia, evidence of the existence and internal structure of an entity referred to as La Casa Nostra or Mafia was offered. If you accept that the organization exists, and if you believe that it had a command and responsibility structure as described by the people's evidence, and if you believe that either defendant or both defendants occupied a position within that organization and a position within the chain of command, then you may, but are not required, to conclude that persons at each level of the chain of command performed according to their positions and responsibilities within that chain of command. If you conclude that such a group does not exist, or if it does that a defendant is not a member or is not in the chain of command at any level, then you must disregard the testimony about their supposed affiliation with organized crime and decide the case on the basis of the other testimony. Evidence of the existence of organized crime and Defendant Gotti and Defendant Guerreri's alleged relation to it was introduced for a limited purpose only. Such evidence, if you accept it, may be used by you on four issues. The first, have a seat please, Mr. Martin. Mr. Foreman, has the jury agreed upon a verdict as to each defendant? Yes, we have. Please rise. As to defendant John Gotti, as to the defendant John Gotti, do you find the defendant guilty or not guilty of the first count of the indictment, charging him with the crime of conspiracy in the fourth degree? We find him not guilty. With respect to the charge of conspiracy in the fifth degree, how say you with respect to defendant John Gotti, guilty or not guilty? We find him not guilty. If, if you folks say anything else, you will not leave the building for the next 30 days. And if you think I'm kidding, I invite you to try it. If 
If you folks can be calm, we will continue with this. If you can't be, we'll interrupt the proceedings. Please continue. As to the second count of the indictment, charging defendant John Gotti with the crime of assault in the first degree, do you find the defendant guilty or not guilty? We find the defendant not guilty. I just want to ask you, when did you hear about the verdict? How did you hear? I just heard it over the radio. Yeah? What do you yeah. think? Uh, I'm excited. I'm glad. Why are you glad? I'm happy. He's a nice man. He's always been good for the neighbor to the neighborhood. Do you think it was unfair what they're what they've done to him? Yes. Yes, I do. Why? I don't I don't really have any special reason. I just think he's a very nice person and he's always been very nice. Right. It's not gonna be Yeah. yeah just to get um, comments from people around the neighborhood. when did you hear about the verdict? Uh, we had the radio on, we were just waiting. Okay. Oh, no comments. All right, let me ask you again. How did you hear? Oh whoops. Uh oh. Look at honey. You okay? We, we had, had the already. radio on. We were waiting for it. You knew that it might be any time? Yes. And what'd you do when you heard? We very ran happy. outside, we clapped, we screamed, we were so happy for him. You know him? Yes, we do. And you're happy for him? What's he Very happy. Him? What kind of a guy is Great he? Great person. It's nice to have on the avenue. Yes. Look, look what everybody did for him. He's excellent with everyone. Great. Thank you both very you're much. You're welcome. All right. Now let's go to... Will you pronounce it Frey? Frey. Yeah. Yeah, my husband. Bradley, say hello. Good luck to God. You always buy your ice cream. That's what you